Good morning and welcome to the United Church of Assonet. Today's meditation, Father, thank you for those you've graciously provided in my life and for those you've allowed me to share life with for our mutual good and your glory from our daily bread. Please join me in the call to worship. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. You have loosed my bonds. Praise the Lord. This morning's opening hymn, Morning Has Broken, is found as an insert in your bulletin. We'll stay seated while we sing the first verse. Uh, my mother will play through the, the whole song once, and then you can sing. Please remain seated and join me in the invocation in the Lord's Prayer. Holy One, who we so often don't recognize, come into our midst and make your presence known. Renew our strength, refresh our imaginations, retool our weary efforts to carry your peace into the world. Amaze us with your power to make all things new and let us face your world with curiosity and hope in the name of the one who leads us on the way Jesus the Christ we pray in Jesus name saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. The announcements are printed on the back of your bulletin. Once again, thank you all for joining us on this beautiful Sunday. First, uh, the flowers on the altar today are given. Nope, okay, we're not doing that one now. <laughs> you can sign up for flowers in the narthex. Um, we, do our, we are looking for fathers for, uh, for Father's Day next week if anyone would like to adorn the altar. Uh, Reverend Baker continues to be available on Fridays in his office for anyone who wishes to make an appointment with him. Uh, his contact information is located inside the bulletin. 
The Sunshine Committee is sending cards and paying visits to people in need. Uh, so please reach out to Linda Wheelock or Don Souza if you have any names of people that might like to receive a card um, or a distance from six feet away. Uh, meeting. <laughs> uh, there's a note here that we need to start scheduling meetings again. So hopefully what this means is the chair people from all the various committees will start reaching out and setting up those meetings um, to happen back on their normal schedule. So look for, for emails and notifications uh, if you sit on a committee. And we continue to collect uh, contributions of food to help people in need in Freetown and Berkeley. Uh, donations can be left in the bin in the North X. Um, we also accept gift cards to local grocery stores. Um, are there any other announcements? Carolyn. The beautiful flowers are still sitting on the table at home, so I'll bring them next week. Okay. <laughs> so we won't need Father's Day flowers then. She's got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> but they will be with this lovely message of congratulations to Caitlin on your graduation and your 18th birthday. Uh, any other announcements? Okay. So I brought my daughter's tablet today. And the reason I did this was because when I was looking at the, um, the video for last week, <clears throat> I would say something, thanks be to God. And there'd be this loud crinkling noise. And I said, well, this might solve that problem and make it um, sound a little bit better on the recording. And plus it's not too intrusive, I hope. So, uh, and again, hopefully we'll have um, those meetings starting up again and we'll be able to you know, get back in the swing of things. I think there was a lot of momentum moving forward before all this happened. And I'd love it if we could get, get, get back going again. Now is the part in our service where we lift up our joys and our concerns to the Lord. We have continued prayers today for um, Manny Santos, Susan Lemos, Christine Vaughn, for Gloria, Barbara Flanders, for Leon Cudworth Sr., for Jack Conway and for Doreen Guthrow. Are there any other prayers at this time? Yes. Uh, a prayer of joy my son's uh, weekend class Sunday from the Marines. Uh, other prayers? Yes. Excuse me. I'm having trouble hearing other people through the mask. So <laughs> Okay, that's good. <laughs> Any other prayers? All right. Then let us be one in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. God of love and mercy, you have called us and all your children into one family through the resurrection of your son, Jesus. By his gracious presence, we look with new eyes at the whole human family and its brokenness and pain. We seek your strength and determination to embrace them, love them, heal them, and share with them your great good news of hope and life. Hear us as we lift to you our deepest needs, our pressing burdens, our fears and hopes. Be near us, we pray, as your people. Help us to receive your many gifts with gratitude and faithful stewardship. We pray for those who suffer pain or illness, <clears throat> for the lonely and despairing, for the lost and worn and battered of our world. And we lift to you the leaders of this and every nation, community, and faith, that they may be guided by your spirit and aware of the needs, especially of the least of their people. We pray especially for Manny, Susan, Christine, Gloria, Barbara, Leon, Jack, Doreen, Sandy, and Brian. And hear now the silent prayers of our hearts as we listen to your word for us.
O Lord, to the sick give your healing, to the grieving give hope, to the dying give your peace, and to all of us, O God, give faith to go forth from this place, determined to live in the light of your good news in Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we offer to you our prayers and our lives. Amen. This time I'd like to uh, invite forward Jeff Field and Betty O'Leary to award the Mim Brown Scholarship. Good morning. Um, I'm pleased to be here this morning to pro um, award the uh, Mim Brown Scholarship. The scholarship was established in 1977, and to this date, there have been 96 scholarships awarded, and they total $54,700. So thank you, Mim. <laughs> I'm just gonna give you a little history of Mim. Um, anybody who's lived in town for a very long time knew Mim, knew her for her laugh, um, and she was an astute businesswoman, and I'm just gonna read a little thing that was written up, um, that was information but given by Ginny French. It's all about Mim's life. Mildred Mim Brown was born in Sonnet on August 7, 1905. She lived her entire life at 38 South Main Street, and she was educated in one-room schools in Sonnet and graduated from Durfee High School in the class of 1924. She was very active all her life in the church, first at the South Christian Church, which is St. Bernard's today, and then, and she taught Sunday school, was a tireless worker for the church suppers, and later as the United Church of Asonet. She was a Girl Scout leader and a very active member of the Tusi Club here in Asonet. In her professional life, she was the owner and president of the Profile Rock Machinery, which bought and sold textile machinery. And later in life, she and a partner owned Westport Factory. Mim was also known for her generosity, not only with her time, but also with her money. She gave generously to help anybody. She especially liked helping young people with college expenses. That is why she started the Mim Brown Scholarship in 1978. All who knew her remember her as a happy and fun-loving person who was full of life, always willing to lend a hand to help. However, she was a perfectionist and everything had to be just so. So if it helped with some, something, it had to be perfect. Mim passed away on Wednesday, November 13th in 1996 at the age of 91 in Fall River. Um, just as a little aside, you know, we talk about her being fun and if you knew Mim, you knew her laugh. She had, like you could hear it for miles. She was just Mim, she loved it. And one memory I have of her as a child, um, and it's just something that stuck out all my life. When I was young, I had a friend, Rosalind, that lived here in town. Jeff knew her, Rosalind Ball. And she, since we have moved away, she was only in a sonnet for a few years. But one day, we spent the day at Mim's house. And I'm not really sure why we were there for the day. But my, the best memory of hanging with Mim was that night on her front porch, we were able to have ice cream sundaes for supper. <laughs> and it was kind of like a devious little thing she did. Our parents, I don't think, ever knew. Um, that was Mim. She was, she was a wonderful, wonderful woman. So I think we'd like to call the Moore family up front. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Noreen. Uh, could I say sure. Uh, I knew Mim well. Uh, she was a wonderful woman. Uh, it's kind of scary when she drove in her car. <laughs> Okay, now the Moore family, can you join us and stand on that side of the altar? For those of you who can't see, Mim is here with us, so if you want to check out this picture later, her bright smile is here for everyone to enjoy. 
So yes, Betty and I, on, part, on behalf of the Mim Brown Scholarship Committee, and that Leanne, includes Leon as well, and our entire United Church of Arizona, are delighted to be able to present this award today. Uh, Caitlin, uh, along with her parents, Carolyn and Dick, been, a, as you all know, are an intricate part of this church. Uh, Caitlin has attended uh, Bishop Stang High School, and uh, she has, has an ec excellent academic success there, so congratulations on that. She's been a member of the National Honor Society and Student Council, and participated in a variety of sports, including field hockey, softball, and winter track. Caitlin will be attending the University of Rhode Island uh, for a six-year program in the College of Pharmacy. So very ambitious, uh, for sure, but I think she's up to the task. <clears throat> it's been a privilege and a pleasure watching you grow up in the church family, and on behalf of everyone here, I feel like we can say you've grown into a delightful young lady. So we're delighted to present this to you today, this little bouquet of flowers, along with the Mim Brown Scholarship. And it's here with the... Uh, Mims brown ribbon as per usual. <laughs> so could all um, join me around. Thank you. All right, so we want to, you know, thank them for everything and congratulations to Caitlin. The psalmist writes, I love our God who heard my cries and prayers. Let us offer our gifts to God at this time to support the life and work of the people of God in our community and around the world. If you have not already given after the service, please place your offering in the plates by the altar or on the plate by the exit. You can also mail checks or give online. And now let us think of how we can better give back to our communities.
And now let us pray. Holy One, accept these gifts and multiply them so that the wonder of your love and justice and peace may be known throughout the world. Amen. Our hymn of preparation this morning is The God of Abram Praise, which you can find as an insert in your bulletin. Testament lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 through 15, and chapters 21, uh, verses 1 through 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves underneath the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on. Since you have come to your servant, so they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them underneath the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely re return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why does Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child, now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God has commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? 
Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Thanks be to God. Today the epistle les lesson is from the book Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we are still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Thanks be to God. Love that mask. <clears throat> so one of the disadvantages of having your senior year be 2020 is that there are so many rites of passage that you miss. And definitely the one rite of passage that I'm sure Caitlin will miss the most is the speech that's given by some boring person at graduation. So please let me fill in at least a little bit into that, um, into that void, if you will. <coughs> And I uh, want to tell everybody that one of the wonders of college is, is that not only do you learn a lot of things in class, but you're then able to apply that learning to the rest of life, very specifically to answering stupid questions with your friends. Now, I spend a lot of time with my friends talking about uh, silly things, and given our propensity towards making jokes and references all the time, we decided to analyze how humor works. This is one of the joys of not having to worry about money. Now, according to some literary theorists and psychologists, there are three main theories of humor. Relief, superiority, and incongruous juxtaposition. Or, as my friend Marion put it, it's funny because it's true, it's funny because it's not you, and it's funny because it's a monkey. All right? Now, given that we're looking at the story of Sarah and the birth of Isaac this morning, I figured we would look at how humor shapes our moods and how this helps us to understand not only the scriptures, but ourselves. All right, let's start with monkey humor, shall we? All right, so here's a joke about a monkey. After a long week of work, Frank grabs his clubs and heads out to the golf course for some much-needed R&R. After a few holes, Frank catches up to a man and a gorilla standing on the par five. Frank finds this odd, but strolls up and sets his ball up on the tee. The man with the gorilla looks at Frank's and says, well, hi there, friend. My name is Steve, and this here is Jojo, the best golfer in the world. Frank can't help it and bursts out laughing. Who in the world has ever heard of a golfing gorilla? That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Now Steve lets, us slip, lets slip a wry smile and says, Well, friend, I'm a betting man. I bet Jojo can out-golf you for the rest of the course. Let's say $500. No, Frank can't believe his luck. Sure that he can easily beat a gorilla in the game of golf. He says, it's a bet. And the two men shake on it. Now, Jojo likes to go first, if that's okay with you, my friend, asked Steve, and Frank nodded. Jojo walks over to his bag of clubs, mangles around, and eventually pulls out a putter. Frank starts chuckling to himself, thinking that he just made some easy money. How long is this hole? About 500 yards? Asked Steve. Frank nodded in agreement. Jojo pranced around his ball for a while and started scratching his back with the putter. And by now, Jojo was doing, I'm oh, sorry, Frank was doing all that he could to stop from laughing. Jojo finally focused on the ball, took his putter in one of his meaty hands, and smacked the ball as hard as he could, letting it just next to the hole on the green. Frank's face turned white. I told you Jojo was good, 
499 yard, I'd say. Said Steve, Frank was now shaking with nerves. He stepped up and hit his ball less than a quarter of the way to the green. <laughs> Seems Jojo got you nervous, my friend. I'll tell you what, if you want, you can give me $250 now and we'll call the bet square. Now Frank knew he'd never be able to hit as far as Jojo, so he gave Steve the money. Care to finish the game, my friend? Frank, already dejected after having lost $250, figured at least he could say that he played with the world's greatest golfer and agreed to finish. Now, Frank managed to sink his ball in five more hits, which is a bogey, not, not too bad. One over par. Now, Jojo stepped up to the green, determination written all over his simian face, the slightest tap ready to sink the ball in the hole. He grabbed the putter out of his golf bag, took it in his meaty hand, and then whacked the ball another 499 yards. Now I'm now going to ruin the joke by explaining it. Now first of all, gorillas are apes, not monkeys. But it does fit this whole incongruous juxtaposition model. A gorilla on a golf course, as Frank observed, is absurd. As is the idea that he would be good at golf. However, just as you think this, this impossible situation is, in fact, a reality, you learn that it was all a scam. The rug is pulled out from under you, and this surprise that you have on multiple levels leads, if I delivered the joke correctly, at least, to humor. Indeed, there are so many surprising and ridiculous things that happen in our lives that we cannot help but laugh at them. Now, the second kind of humor is superiority humor, or it's funny because it's not you. Now, slapstick, most of satire fall under this category, as do things like ethnic jokes, blonde jokes, how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb jokes, and any other joke that generally derives its humor from a feeling of sense or a sense of superiority over another person or group. Now, this can be the most dangerous form of humor because it often relies on stereotypes. Now, a safe example of this kind of joke, to tell in church at least, are lawyer jokes. And my father is a lawyer, so he's heard them all and they don't bother him. Now, there are classics in this genre, like what is the difference between a catfish and a lawyer? One is a scum-sucking, bottom-feeding scavenger and the other is a fish. There are ones with a more religious or moral bent, like this one. A 50-year-old lawyer who had been practicing since he was 25 died and arrived at the pearly gates for judgment. The lawyer said to St. Peter, there must be some mistake. I'm only 50 years old. That's far too young to die. And St. Peter frowned and he consulted his book and said, hmm, 50 years old. That's funny. When we add up all your billable hours, it says you should be at least 83 by now. All right. Finally, there's this one. A rabbi, a Hindu, and a lawyer are in a car that breaks down on the countryside one evening. They walk to a nearby farm, and the farmer tells them that it's too late for a tow truck and that he only has two extra beds, so one of them is going to have to sleep in the barn. The Hindu says, my needs are few, I will sleep in the barn. But minutes later, he returns and knocks on the door and says, I'm sorry, but there's a cow in the barn, and it's against my beliefs to sleep in the same building as a cow. So the rabbi says, it's okay, I'll sleep in the barn. But soon he is back knocking on the door, as well as saying, there's a pig in the barn and I cannot shelter in a building that has a pig in it. So the lawyer is now forced to sleep in the barn. Now shortly there is another knock on the door, and the farmer sighs and answers it. And who do you think it is? It's the pow and the pig, that's right. All right. Now these jokes play on the stereotype that lawyers are greedy, manipulative, unlikable, and generally make the world worse through their sophistic twisting of facts and reason to suit their own ends. Of course, most lawyers are not actually like this, but the stereotype persists. And when we laugh at these kind of jokes, we make ourselves feel morally superior to this person, which is ironically lowers our morality by falling into cruelty. However, since the world can be very cruel, as well as ridiculous, sometimes we need a type of humor that strikes back at the personal and impersonal forces that make our lives difficult. Ideally, we should learn to laugh with the world 
and not at it. Especially if it makes us bitter in the process. All right, remember when I said I, that was the last lawyer joke? I lied, I got one more. All right, so how many lawyer jokes are there? The answer is there are only three, and the rest are true stories. And this leads us into our final form of humor, the humor of recognition or relief, or it's funny because it's true. Now these are sometimes phrased as a, as a joke, you know, it's kind of your standard three parts and a punchline, but they're more likely to take on the form of anecdotes. In watching some stand-up comedians, I hear plenty of unexpected puns or callbacks, but many of the best stand-up routines simply find the humor in everyday life. Uh, either it's something that happened to the comic or something that they are pretending happened to them. This kind of humor is in many ways the opposite of the superiority type because it instead builds a sense of commonality, of relief, of recognition, that we are not alone in this strange and wonderful world in which we live. And this kind of humor comes not from the emotions of surprise or anger, but ultimately from that of joy. Now today we heard of a very important episode in the much larger story of Abraham, which takes up about 30% of the book of Genesis. So there's quite a lot of stories in there. Now the overarching theme of all of this is that the story of Abraham teaches us about faith. When Abram, as he was originally known, is 75 years old, God comes to him and promises, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Ten years pass, and no great nation comes, not even a single child. Then God promises that Abraham's descendants will be more numerous than the stars. Now, Abram has a son by his wife's maidservant, Ishmael, but none from his wife, Sarai. Fourteen more years pass, and God appears again, this time demanding circumcision as a sign of Abram's faith. God changes Abram's name to Abraham and his wife Sarai's name to Sarah. Then God says, I will bless Sarah, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. Here is Abraham's response. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Now later, three mysterious men appear at Abraham's house, looking for hospitality. It is clear that this is God and two angels, or perhaps some sort of proto-trinity, depending on who you ask, but clearly divine figures. And over dinner, the man says that when he returns a season later, Sarah will have borne a son. Now this time it's Sarah's turn to laugh. Genesis says, And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. But he said, Oh yes, you did laugh. Now how does this biblical story reflect our analysis of humor? First off, there is the absurdity of a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman having a child. This itself is somewhat humorous in that monkey sort of way. There's also a note of anger and bitterness in this laugh. Abraham and Sarah have been waiting 25 years for a child, and of course for 75 years before that almost. And even though God pops up every few years to reaffirm the promise of endless offspring, nothing ever happens. Abraham persists in his faith, but to be honest, he's still frustrated by what's happening. To both him and Sarah, this final promise seems like just one more empty gesture, like God is laughing at them by constantly denying them their fondest wish. Like Lucy pulling the football away from Charlie Brown, there are only so many times that Abraham can persist in his faith before he loses it. Of course, God is not cruel and fulfills the promise. Now, I've always felt that Sarah's denial of laughing and the man catching her in it was not God being critical, 
of Sarah's lack of faith, but rather winking at her that things would be more than stinging disappointment. He wanted to share that laugh with her. Now, Abraham and Sarah could not have been the parents that they were meant to be had they not gone through the wars and the temptations and the other adventures that they had along those during all those endless chapters in Genesis. Their child was going to be a miracle of biology. But the miracle that was his faith, that came from his parents. So after the horrors of Sodom and Gomorrah, and after almost being stolen by a foreign king, Genesis says this about the baby's birth. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his child, which means he laughs. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham and Sarah that she would nurse children? And yet I have borne him a son in my old age. With the promise fulfilled, Sarah's laugh is one of joy. It's one of relief. It's a recognition that all these crazy and funny things were true, that they were real. Now, for the reason why this story has been told and retold for millennia is that we, too, are to find comfort and relief in its happy ending. It's a story that shows us that no matter how ridiculous or difficult our lives may be, we can all laugh at it in the end. You know, think of funerals. People always think of funerals as solemn and sad occasions. And when they laugh at things, they kind of chuckle to themselves under their, under their hands or maybe into their masks these days. But that laughter is natural. When we remember our loved ones and we have those memories, both the happy and the sad, it's often the most relief that we get is often through laughter. As they say, he who laughs last, laughs best. Now, you could also put a theological spin on this idea, which you can find in Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul has highlighted Abraham's faith as a model for salvation. And then he writes, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and through whom we've obtained access, and through his grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope in the sharing of God. Now, because we believe in God despite the confusing nature of the world, we have hope, one th which through grace can blossom into laughter. And then Paul says, and not only that, but we also boast in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Here Paul says that even our suffering can lead to hope and joy if it is used with faith as a lens to interpret it, just as Abraham and Sarah did in their lives. Now, this is the only life on earth that we're going to have, and it is natural and appropriate that we take it seriously. You know, we cannot just quip about monkeys for our whole lives. But at the same time, we must also have a sense of lightness to what we do. Otherwise, the cruelty of life will make us miserable, and the absurdity of life will drive us bananas. You see what I did there? Okay. So let us laugh at the world. Let us use laughter to bring us relief in our low moments and joy at our lofty triumphs. After all, if we can laugh at any situation, we will discover that with God, nothing is too wonderful. Let us pray. Lord God, help us to find the humor in our lives. Remind us that your love for us transcends not only space and time, 
but also the circumstances of life. Continue to bless us today and always. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, which you can find as a bullet in your bulletin, is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. And now let us go forth from this time together with hearts open to the surprising, inexhaustible love of God. Let us greet friends and strangers with the gifts of Christ, mercy, justice, and joy. Expect the Spirit to meet us wherever we are in struggle, in grief, and in peace. And know that the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will be with you always. Amen. Again, let us dismiss with rows starting in the back and then in the center. <laughs>